much. Welcome back everyone from the break. I hope you really enjoyed that music from Esh, a beautiful voice. I am so excited to get to moderate this panel on state policy and what's being done to address maternal mental health at that level. We have three guests joining us on the main stage today, um, starting with Beth Buxton. She's a licensed clinical social worker and director of maternal and infant health initiatives at uh, in Massachusetts. Um, she'll be speaking first, but I'm gonna introduce our other panelists as well right now. Um, they'll be joining us on the stage uh, following Beth. Um, next is Amy Zapata. She's a master's of public health and the director of the Louisiana Bureau of Family Health. And then we'll also be joined by Royce Duplessis, a state representative from Louisiana's District 93, we're so excited to have the three of them join us on the main stage right now. And the way the panel will flow is that we have two presentations. First from Beth Buxton, who's with us live right now. She'll be talking a little bit about the great work that Massachusetts has done to really lay the foundation for the rest of the US and um, other states to follow. And then we'll hear from Amy talking about the work that has been done in uh, Louisiana thus far. So Beth, welcome back to the main stage. Good to see you and I'm gonna turn it over to you. We'll be pulling up your slides right now. Thank you so much, Joy, it's great to see you. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really grateful and humbled to be um, part of this incredible virtual conference. Um, I've always loved and admired 2020 moms. And so thank you um, for being here and listening. Um, and next slide. So I'd like to share with you some of the work, just a brief overview of the work we've done in Massachusetts and, and connect you. You will receive these slides. So all of these links you'll be able to see and access for yourself. We first started um, with postpartum depression legislation and this act was um, enacted in 2010. It required that healthcare providers and health plans, health insurers, to report their screening data to DPH on an annual basis. And that began in 2015. Uh, and that link there for you will actually download um, and show you the legislative language that we used. Um, next slide, please. So the regulation data, we uh, worked very closely with our Medicaid program to identify a claims code um, that could be used by health plans and insurers to report the screening data uh, on an annual basis, on a regular basis to the Department of Public Health. And here in the box is that um, code that we identified. And with Medicaid, our Medicaid program, we use it at the department for reporting. Medicaid uses it as a mechanism for payment and reimbursement to providers. Um, other health plans um, configured their system to accept this claim code um, and set it at zero, largely our private um, insurers, but we're still working with them to see if we can um, uh, incentivize them to reimburse providers for their screening. Uh, the data is then sent on to the Center for Health Information. The Department of Public Health has, the Department of Public Health has um, data sharing agreements in place uh, so that we can access this data on an annual basis. And we do produce a legislative report. Um, next slide. Um, yes, as I said, MassHealth and uh, DPH have aligned our efforts. We've also developed collectively in collaboration a PPD screening um, tool grid that provides information on the validity, um, the reliability, where a person can access the screening tool, what languages are offered, how much it costs, if it does cost anything. That's available up on our website in the FS link at the bottom. And in addition to that, we've been working with MassHealth who are adopting um, a HEDIS measure uh, in, a, in addition to really think about um, improving our screening rates. Next slide. So here's some of the initial data. I will say it is not as robust as we would like, and we are going to be implementing a quality improvement process this summer to address it. Um, but what we do know is um, only 20, 19% of the people who gave birth during uh, 2017 were actually screened. 
Um, and of those screenings, a little over uh, 1,200 individuals were screened positive. Um, the proportion of birthing parents who were screened were higher among the Asian um, and American Indian communities um, compared to Hispanic and Black non-Hispanic um, families. This really continues to be racial inequities in the screening, as well as connection to resources and uh, re re uh, resources and referrals for families. Uh, the Proportion of positive screens were higher among birthing parents who were covered by our, our Medicaid services <clears throat> compared to those who are on private insurance. And the positive screens decreased as birthing parents' education level increased, um, which is also uh, indicative of social injustice and inequities. Um, next slide. So I'd like to go through just a few of the resources and supports we've put in place uh, since those regulations and that legislation was passed. Um, next slide. So as part of that legislation, we also as a state established the Massachusetts Ellen Story Postpartum Legislative Commission. Um, and it's Postpartum Depression Legislative Commission. I forgot that word in the slide, my apologies. Um, it is 32 members who are appointed by not, not only our Senate and our House of Representatives, but also our governor. And it includes a diverse group of individuals, including individuals with lived experience, representatives from state agencies, health plans, and advocacy groups. And they've done some incredible work um, in terms of getting funding for the state uh, initiatives and priorities. And I'll go through each of these activities in the following slides. So next slide, please. The first you probably are very familiar with is McPath for Moms, which is um, a consultation program that is available to any provider who uh, is working with a, a family who has screened positive for postpartum depression. And that includes pediatricians, it includes psychiatrists, it includes obstetric providers. Um, this consultation is free to the providers and um, it's really supports, our goal is really to support the provider in feeling comfortable in prescribing and or referring this family um, who screams positive to additional services and supports. Uh, it's been highly effective in engaging a wider group of providers in thinking about postpartum depression screening, actually conducting the screening, and then feeling comfortable in supporting a family as they navigate resources, referrals, and as well as uh, managing their symptoms. What I love about McPat for Moms more recently is they've really expanded their expertise to include work with individuals who also have um, substance use disorders, um, which as you, I'm sure you know, the comorbidity between those two can be pretty significant. And again, there's the link there to their web, pi uh, web page if you're interested. Next slide. The Legislative Commission has also ensured funding to support postpartum depression pilot programs, which are no longer pilots. They've really been established now uh, where universal postpartum depression screenings are conducted at community health centers. And at these sites, um, the funding is to support hiring and training a community health worker to work with the physicians at that community health center to really ensure that any family who screens positive for postpartum depression is not only supported, but actually warm handoffs are made so that family is able to access services as needed. Um, the data from this inf information has been pretty significant. Uh, almost 87% of individuals who are, arrive at an appointment at the community health center um, receives a postpartum depression screen. And of those, um, there have been 830 face-to-face -face encounters with postpartum individuals um, by the community health worker where they're actually sitting down engaging with this family. Um, and it's been uh, extremely positive. So during the summer, we will actually be documenting uh, and evaluating this process so that we can disseminate the results widely. Next slide, please. Thanks. 
Um, another thing that the uh, Legislative Commission was able to do was fund uh, the implementation of a perinatal mental health data analysis plan, which has been um, what I've been referring to previously in the last two slides. We will be using this plan as a roadmap for implementing the quality improvement and evaluation of the programs. It was uh, conducted as a very um, intensive uh, and supportive evaluation plan so we can really get a better idea of what's happening in the state and how we can improve data collection and surveillance. This report was submitted to the legislators and at the link at the bottom, you can actually download this report and see it for yourself. Um, and it's been wonderful. It's been an amazing resource for all of us. Uh, we're very grateful for that funding. Next slide. The other thing we were able to do, we use Title V funding for this, the Maternal and Child Health Block Grant, where we were able to develop a brochure, an educational brochure, um, in collaboration with perinatal providers and people with lived experience so that we can ensure that um, there's a story here from a mom sharing her story. And the goal of this is really to um, um, connect people with our PSI um, ch uh, chapter in Massachusetts. If you go to this link, you can see this brochure and you can download it for free. Um, and it is um, printable versions are free to any Massachusetts resident or organization. Next slide. And that's all I have for you um, at this point. Please feel free to share any questions and I will look forward to um, answering those at a later time. Thank you all. And at this point, I am very grateful um, to introduce my colleague, Amy Zapata. Um, I'll pass it off to you, Amy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Amy Zapata. I'm the director of the Bureau of Family Health within the Louisiana Department of Health. I'm the state's Title V Maternal and Child Health Program Director um, and talking just very briefly today about some what I think is momentum around how we're using data and policy and systems change for maternal health, some of the ways that we're doing that and how we're now then focusing on advancing maternal mental health in the state. Next slide, please. So for me, our work is, um, is guided by uh, trying to have some, some, some big statements. What do we want to see for what we would like to see for every mom, every family, every baby, every individual who gives birth in our state? And so there are two guiding thoughts here. One is we would like, I would like to see for every, all individuals who are pregnant and who have a baby in the state's birthing facilities, have the confidence that Louisiana has ready providers, ready facilities, and ready systems of care, and that we are a ready state for safe birth. And I'm excited to say that we're having some really um, interesting and really good progress in that um, in that direction, in partnership with many many uh, many policymakers and hospital systems and and, um, and providers and advocates. So that's what we'd like to see for all individuals who are pregnant and have a baby in our state. And then we'd like to see for all prenatal and pediatric clinical providers in the state to have the support that they need to screen and respond to maternal depression. Uh, maternal mental health conditions generally and um, other uh, conditions and factors affecting the developmental health of young children. And so why these particular priorities? There's absolutely need. Uh, there is momentum. We have activated systems, activated advocates, activated legislative champions, one of whom you'll meet in just a moment. And there is enabling policy with really more every day and existing infrastructure that can be scaled and spread for what we would like to, to see and achieve. Next slide, please. And so there are a couple of ways that we're doing that. We are using public health data to inform and clarify needed actions. Next. We are also having policy that reinforces and enables and reinforces what we'd like to see. And the next. We are, have different ways that we are supporting our systems to execute. Next slide, please. So if I just synopsis of each one of these, so public health data to inform and clarify needed actions. One of the main, um, one of the main data sources that we have been using to drive our priorities and what we're doing is our multi multidisciplinary community engaged review of all maternal deaths in the state. We are also have a multidisciplinary review of all deaths among children in the state. 
And for both of those, we our intention is to determine preventability and to generate recommendations for policy and systems change. So that really has been among the anchors, not all, the only anchors, but among the anchors of, of data um, that we've been using to identify where do we want to go and how do we get there. Two of the other data systems that, um, that uh, um, most states have, um, or many states do, is the Pregnancy Risk Assessment and Monitoring System, um, the PRAMS. And then we have our Title V Maternal and Child Health Block Grant Needs Assessment every five years, where we're really getting up onto the balcony and looking at data from all different sources and determining where it is that we want to go and what do we need. And what we can see, have been seeing pretty consistently in, in those is, um, is a, needs around maternal health, maternal mental health in particular. Next slide. So the next step in our kind of three-part action is policy that enables and reinforce what we want to see. And so for those, we've been building in some, a, a number of different initiatives um, and areas of policy. One is that our Title V needs assessment a number of years ago um, indicated, um, uh, we looked at early brain science um, identified social, emotional, and caregiver depression issues as one of the, one of the main areas of developmental concern. And so we uh, created the Louisiana Developmental Screening Initiative and uh, created Louisiana Developmental Screening Guidelines, which are voluntary guidelines as, as a policy initiative in, in these different domains to try to reinforce identification, sort of recognition and response to maternal or caregiver depression um, and other uh, uh, behavioral health concerns. Um, we have also been working on Medicaid policy together with our Medicaid partners for caregiver depression screening um, using evidence-based uh, screening tools. Um, we Medicaid in the state, so this is not me, but Medicaid within the state has also been advancing policy um, in addition to the, the, um, the screening um, and payment change is an in lieu of benefit for pregnancy medical home uh, model of care for individuals with substance use disorder. Another area of policy, really significant policy change, has been on new licensure requirements for birthing facilities. And while we might think of that as primarily around hemorrhage and hypertension and sort of levels of care in that way, we absolutely are weaving in um, uh, considerations uh, for recognition and response to, um, to uh, mental health concerns. And then there have been many, many, many uh, legislative actions over the past number of years. Um, one is, uh, will be introduced by um, that Representative Duplessis, who's joining me after, um, is the Maternal Mental Health Task Force, really focusing in particular on the mental health needs and recognition response to mental health needs of Black and Brown women in our state. We've also, there was another um, uh, legislation around promoting evidence-based screening and maternal depression. Um, we just completed an assessment of top to bottom um, of the entire Louisiana Department of Health of what are the actions being taken related to women's health generally. And one of the most salient areas where there is identified need and opportunity for public health approaches is around behavioral health and mental health and services in particular for women. Um, we have been working on establishing a duly registry board and Medicaid has been working um, and advocates have been working towards 12 month postpartum coverage. All right, next slide. And then the last is um, how is it that we support our systems to execute? Um, all what we, again, what we really like to see is all prenatal and pediatric clinical providers in the state will have the support that they need to recognize and respond to, to maternal behavioral health concerns and other concerns affecting the developmental health of, of children. And I think Beth did a really nice job of, put, of giving a really, really concrete example of, of how that's being put into place. And that's one of the areas where we're working as well is that consultation system. Next slide. And so this last uh, slide is, how is it that we're supporting our systems to execute? And one is mental health consultation approaches. There are many that are longstanding, um, initiated a long time ago in partnership with Tulane University, um, where there's this deep psychiatry expertise um, nationally recognized, internationally recognized, um, and that has started with embedding um, mental health consultants within some of our key programs and early childhood systems. It is now um, moving to a mental health provider, provider consultation system. The so Louisiana Mental Health Perinatal Partnership, um, which is very much modeled in, after the, the uh, Massachusetts model to support early identification of perinatal risks and mental health symptoms and uh, to support providers to implement the first line management of mental health um, uh, mental health and substance use disorders and make effective referrals and um, uh, to additional community resources. We also, our Louisiana Developmental Screening Initiative um, includes perinatal depression. I have a link at the end 
Um, and we have a provider toolkit that is interactive with videos and step-by-step -step for how can pediatric providers integrate um, this type of screening into their practice, which is different both on a clinical as well as administrative side um, for integrating that, that, that caregiver um, uh, aspect and technical assistance to support integration of practice. And then for me, the last um, area is our Louisiana Perinatal Quality Collaborative, where we have, we're working with almost all facilities in the state um, around a number, of, a number of different initiatives. We have about 14 of our almost 50 facilities working on improving care for the substance exposed um, dyad, um, respectful and effective evidence-based care during uh, recognition of response during labor delivery and beyond. Um, and to discharge uh, for individuals um, identified um, uh, with potential substance use concerns. Caregiver perinatal depression screening pilot in pediatric practices, we're just in the very beginning stages of that. And then overall, we all of our work through the Perinatal Quality Collaborative on all of our other initiatives as well are guided by a theory of change that is with reliable clinical practices, respectful patient partnership, effective peer teamwork and engaged leadership, that's where we can generate change. And we do know that that's possible. We're seeing decreased um, uh, complications if you be able to um, hemorrhage and, and hypertension um, and decreasing um, uh, gaps um, in, in, the, in disparities um, in some of those outcomes. And so really feeling like we are on the cusp of a lot of momentum um, for changing some of our systems of care and our um, and supporting our systems of care to do what we know everybody wants to do. So many thanks um, for uh, the opportunity to speak today. And none of this would be possible. Um, a lot of this would not be possible without having really engaged legislative partners, such as my colleague, um, Rep Representative Duplessis, who I will turn it over to now. Thank you. Amy, and um, good afternoon. I'm certainly honored and a privilege to have been asked to speak briefly on this on this uh, webinar. I am uh, Royce Duplessis, state representative from uh, Louisiana. I represent New Orleans in particular, the innermost part of the city. And um, I was asked to just talk a little bit about kind of what brought me into doing uh, some of this work legislatively. I have a number of different issues that I work on, but this issue around maternal mental health was something that honestly coming into the legislature, I cannot say that I, I was very knowledgeable about, uh, but sometime around 2018, in the spring of 2018, uh, my, my wife was uh, pregnant. We were expecting our first child and it wasn't the conversation so much around maternal mental health, but as uh, it was more around just maternal health in general. In Louisiana, uh, the outcomes are not the best. Uh, about uh, one in four uh, is, is, the, is the statistics in Louisiana. Uh, the New York Times had done this uh, big article on the issue, highlighting some of, many of the disparities that exist, specifically in Louisiana, but we also know it's an issue nationally. And uh, it was around that time where I just started to uh, become more curious and interested in, in trying to see what could be done through policy to close these gaps and deal with this issue uh, around uh, maternal health in general. And as I began to work with advocates and learn more, the issue of maternal mental health was brought to my attention as something that also needed focus and that's something that we needed to draw more attention to. And LDH, uh, Department of Health, as Amy already pointed out, uh, has been doing a whole lot of work around this through just administrative policy, separate and apart from any specific legislation that we were introducing, but uh, they recognize it at the department, which I'm, I'm so proud to be able to work in partnership with them as we try to put more of a focus on this issue to get better outcomes for our, for our moms and for our children, because we recognize the direct link between the mother's health and the child's health and the intergenerational connection that exists, but also how that connects to our entire community. So uh, last year in 2021, uh, as Amy already pointed out, uh, I filed two legislative instruments. Uh, one was House Concurrent Resolution 103, and that was uh, basically an urgent request to all state agencies, but specifically the Department of Health 
to address this issue of uh, maternal depression and anxiety and to work towards developing and implementing screenings and facilitating evidence-based practices around preventative care, early identification and uh, treatment services. So that was one piece that we worked on and it was all about just pushing the department to implement evidence-based approaches uh, around uh, expanding provider training, education, support and implementation of, of standards of, uh, of care that went across all practices, both perinatal and pediatric settings. And, um, and trying to expand our um, OB healthcare workforce to include psychiatric specialists. And also again, trying to deal with this issue around screenings at the trimester, at the first part postpartum visit and at the six month postpartum uh, visit. So that was one piece that we worked on. And in addition to that, just trying to increase overall awareness. The other resolution that we passed last year was the uh, establishment of a task force that was made up of 20 different uh, stakeholder entities that was just all about uh, education, treatment, and overall improvement of maternal mental health within our state. And that task force uh, over the past year worked to develop and, and basically present what would, would, would ultimately be a, um, a, a bill that I just recently filed for this legislative session. Which, was, which is known as the Perinatal Mood and Anxiety Disorders Act. So uh, that has a couple of different components. And I actually had a call with LDH this morning. We're working out some, we're working out some language right now. Uh, it's not in its final form. There are some, some issues we have to work through around the mandate component of it, uh, which I am certainly sensitive to because we want to give doctors um, whether they be uh, pediatricians or uh, the OBGYNs, that level of discretion. And I know other states uh, have, have done this as well. I think New Jersey did it uh, a while back. And um, we heard a presentation just a second ago uh, about another state that that's, that's taken these steps, as have several other states throughout the country. But, uh, but basically what we want to put in place in Louisiana prior to discharge following any pregnancy that that there be information provided around postpartum depression, everything around symptoms, treatment, and available resources. Uh, we want to put screening mechanisms in place, uh, whether they be uh, required or whether uh, you know doctors have the discretion to know, look, this is something that we just simply should be doing as much as we possibly can. Uh, up to 12 months post-delivery, we want to we want to have those those pieces in place. So um, that's ultimately what we're trying to do, working in collaboration with the Bureau of Family Health and Amy's uh, office to try to disseminate uh, a, a database of providers. I know that that's gonna be another step that's gonna involve um, more work as we try to put a list of uh, a database together. I know that's gonna involve a lot more work. So that's something that was brought to my attention by LDH and I'm gonna work with LDH as we try to come up with more um, innovative ways to create awareness and, 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 and make moms knowledgeable about this, make family members knowledgeable about this so that we can deal with this issue that um, statistically shows that so many of our moms uh, are impacted by um, postpartum depression and, and overall um, symptoms related to um, uh, maternal mental health. So we still have a lot of work to do, but I'm very encouraged by uh, everybody who's on this call right now and, and everything that I've heard and I'm very encouraged to work alongside with LDH to promote um, healthier outcomes for our moms. So with that, I'm gonna bring my comments to a close and just know that you have a partner in me and I look forward to more work to come. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Representative Duplessis um, and also Beth and Amy. It's a uh, real, it's re very energizing. Um, and hopeful to know that there are partners like all of you um, and Representative Duplessis, especially you. Um, we need we need more of you in every state. So thank you for your leadership. I wanted to just unpack some of what we heard together um, as a group, and I thought where we could start first is just to frame for our attendees, who many are new to the policy um, world, a little bit about um, you know federal policy 
and state policy levers, and then there's how, there's regulation and legislation, and how does it all fit together? So I thought I'd start there by giving a little bit of an overview, and any of you who want to jump in and talk about kind of your jurisdiction and what you um, can do and why you need to do it, I think that would be be helpful. So just um, quickly, you know, what we've found in our policy work at 2020 Mom is that the federal government's really in a um, position. Um, to provide funding to states to do important work, like through the Maternal Child Health Block Grant, which we heard both Amy and Beth um, mention earlier, sort of what's the level of funding available in those block grants for departments of public health, for example, to do work um, at their own discretion around maternal mental health. Um, another bill, right, the Moms Matter Act, we talked about that in the last session, provides funding um, to states to, uh, to states to provide funding to community-based organizations um, in their local communities. Um, and actually, I might be misspeaking a bit because it might actually be a federal agency that distributes those grants to community-based organizations. I think some of that language will be, um, will be teased out uh, later if and when Moms Matter Act passed is, um, in addition to providing funding for um, black and brown people to become trained as uh, mental health providers. So kind of funding as a lever uh, and sometimes new frameworks, right, for states to follow Medicaid dollars, for example. So that's why we need federal policy. States though really have um, leverage and that's where, where the rubber hits the road when it comes to health policy in the United States, which is perhaps good, perhaps bad. Some believe there should be a floor that everyone follows and states add on. Um, that's hard to do in the US um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but that's why we need Rep Duplessis to do this important work. For example, states would mandate screening as he has talked about in Louisiana, um, New Jersey, Illinois, California, for example, have, have tackled state mandated um, screening. Um, and, then, and then departments of public health can issue regulation. Sometimes the, there's a needs to be a, a law that says they have authority to issue regulation. Sometimes um, new regulation perhaps can be issued without a new law. Um, so I wanted to start there. Beth, um, Rep Duplessis, um, Amy, anything else you wanna add just to help our audience get their bearings on the levers? I'll briefly just, just take a quick, I'll make a quick comment because I, I wanted to say this while I was presenting and I, and I didn't. Um, you know, as a legislator, I think we oftentimes feel the, the need and the urge that we have to do something legislatively, like we need to file something. When, when a lot of times it may not be necessary. Because um, again, when, when uh, Amy's presenting, and I think they've been probably run into this with legislators quite often, where they have made, they may already be regulations in place that allow for what it is that we're trying to achieve. Am I saying anything incorrect, Amy? No, I mean, I, I, you're, you're getting in the, where I'm, where my mind is going also is sometimes we don't need um, regulation. Sometimes you actually don't really want it because people don't want to be told what to do. So, sometimes you need it to really help make sure the right thing is happening, but so often you don't. And one of the things that I feel like is pretty, um, particularly powerful Representative Duplass is about what you've done over the past couple of years is, although it definitely is a lot of work for the different study resolutions, what it does, it pulls people together um, and it around a very particular focused issue. So you take a big issue and you look at one part of it and say, what can be done on this part of it? Um, and so I think um, that, that it is, there are the federal laws and federal levers and funding, and then there are the state laws and levers and regulations, but there's, at the end of the day, a lot of these things can be accomplished by creating clarity on some paths of action that can be taken at multiple levels. And, uh, and I, I think that's one of the, the, the areas where there's powerful. And then if it's not gonna happen of goodwill or because, or because of just you know, wanting to improve quality of something, then the policy um, is a really good reinforcing loop, I think. That's really helpful feedback, Beth. You probably have thoughts, but one quick um, tie off is that I feel like your task force legislation and framework is helpful in bringing everyone together, right? To create that kind of framework, Amy, what you're saying is, you know, what we need clarity on, what can we already do? We just need to spend some time thinking about it. Um, so thank you for, for that. 
I also did drop in some model legislation. Um, 2020 Mom's been involved in some state policy work for some time, tracking what states are doing and also pushing for some policy change in California to test what's um, possible. And you can all take a look at that model legislation. Um, Beth, I want to turn it to you. What are your thoughts about state levers and what you've been able to do with quite a bit in Massachusetts? When have you needed policy and when maybe did you not need it? Yeah, thank you. Legislation, thank you so I should say. When did you not need legislation? It's all yeah. about um, I think with the legislation that was passed in 2010, one of the greatest benefits was that legislative commission that's made up of both uh, policymakers, state officials, but more importantly, people with lived experience and advocates in the community uh, and people who are really passionate about this. And you start bringing these individuals together in a room and they it is amazing how much work that can get done. Um, and one of the things that they do every year that I didn't mention is they have a celebration uh, every year around uh, perinatal mental health and substance use awareness day where they're not only um, holding an event and um, celebrating people with lived experience. They're, they're sharing their stories and, and celebrating their recovery and uh, identifying what resources were important to them. But it's also closely connected to advocacy with our legislative body. Um, and so it's quickly followed up at the state house where people are going door to door their legislatures and talking to them about what's really important. And part of that includes things like doula services. People are talking about doulas. People are talking about postpartum care for 12 months, um, health insurance through Medicaid. Uh, there are a multitude of legislative asks that are on the table that impact perinatal mental health that they're able to um, really leverage and support. And so I'm very grateful for that commission. That's great. I'll just add that um, Massachusetts is unique. There is no other standing commission addressed um, or focused solely on maternal mental health disorders in, in any state. Um, and it's a, it's a multi-sector commission. We call it a legislative commission in Massachusetts, but private partners, physicians, advocates, others sit on that legislative commission. So really interesting um, model and as Beth said has really helped Massachusetts get a lot of work done without new legislation. So thank you, Beth, for all the work that's been happening there. I want to go back to some of the data that you shared, um, Beth. Um, one is that you know only only 12 percent of women have been screened in Massachusetts, um, and that was in 2017. Perhaps the numbers would have rise, rose a little bit more since then with greater awareness, but we suspect that's about right in the U.S. Um, you also mentioned that there's a HEDIS measure. And for those of you that were with us on the first day, we discussed the HEDIS measure briefly in the opening session. And this is, um, this is a measure that is put in place, was developed by private funders, uh, funding, funding, not developed by private funders, developed because of some private funding, which is a whole nother story, very, makes it very interesting to have quality measures developed um, um, with private funding, needing to have private funding often to do that. But a measure was developed and it's been tested, being tested for about two years now. And um, it gets rolled out through payers. And we've talked about the constellation of P's on day one, providers, payers, and payers include Medicaid agencies, private insurance companies, and even employers who use private insurance companies to administer their own um, employee benefit plans. Those are payers. Um, so HEDIS is deployed through insurance contracts um, or plans, health plans, if it's a Medicaid plan. Um, and we'll start to look at how often obstetricians are screening for maternal mental health disorders as sort of the obstetric medical home and pregnancy and in the postpartum period. Um, and so Beth, if we can just talk a little bit about, you know, I also found it very interesting that um, indigenous populations and Asian Americans in Massachusetts re received screening at higher rates. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit why that might be? Is there an Indian health system maybe that has deployed screening more broadly early on? Um, what do you think is happening with the Asian population? That is exactly what we're going to try to figure out this summer. Um, we are bringing in um, a John Hopkins Fellow to really look at that. The question for us is, I don't know 
if screening is not happening or if people are providers are not reporting the screening. Those are two different um, issues that we may need to deal with. Are people utilizing the claims code and being reimbursed for that service? And does that reflect in our lower rates? And so what we've done initially is we've gone out to several community health centers and had verbal conversations. I'm like, this is what your data is showing, what's happening in your clinic. And they're like, we screen everyone. We have universal screening. We don't know what's going on that you're not getting the data. Um, and so what we're doing this summer is starting at the community health centers, we'll evaluate that process and then move to insurance companies. Are they accepting the code? Um, claims code? If not, what's the barrier there? And then with those insurance companies, are they passing it along to the all payers claim data system, which is a legislative requirement in Massachusetts. And so the goal is not to be punitive, but the goal is to be understanding of what the barriers are and to really support um, a more robust data collection process. Uh, just because it, if we don't have the data, it's really hard to advocate for the interventions and supports. Got it. Um, thank you, Beth. Um, helpful. And I really, I think all of us will be so excited to see what comes out of your data initiative and what the rest of us can learn from um, all that Massachusetts is collecting. I did also want to point out, though, um, that that private insurance is not reimbursing yet, right? There's no requirement um, and that there are lower rates for private of screening being reported anyway for for private, privately insured patients. And that's really interesting. Also on day one, there was a great conversation about the need to reimburse private insurers and Medicaid plans that aren't already doing that. Um, reimburse for screening outside of the maternity global capitation um, rate. So more work to happen there. And we'll be um, following that from Massachusetts. Um, I wanted to bring it back um, to, to Louisiana for just a minute. And Amy, if you could tell us a little bit about um, the caregiver screening pilot, again, that is fascinating. Um, so providers certainly play a role in the constellation that we talked about on day one. Um, there was also partners and families as one of the nine Ps. And so your caregiver screening pilot, tell us just a little bit more about what that will look like. Sure. So that is um, really just implementation of uh, uh, perinatal depression screening in pediatric practices. And so we're doing that. <laughs> We're doing that through our perinatal quality collaborative and those four main areas where we're looking for change are recognition and response and respectful patient partnership, engaged leadership. We use a quality improvement. Um, we have all been trained in the Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, breakthrough collaborative series model. <clears throat> and so before we ever do a statewide um, uh, initiative, um, we are usually doing a pilot. So we're working with four practices um, and we'll, we haven't started this yet, but we've just identified them and we'll be looking at um, what will it take for them to really integrate that high quality screening and referral and linkage to care um, in pediatric practices for uh, caregiver depression, for perinatal depression. Very good, thank you. And caregiver means then screening both mother, father, and whoever's caring for the child. Thank you and for- And for... policy reimbursement was structured not as just screening of mother, but of uh, who have, who for the Fathers as well. Yep. Caregivers. Very good. Thank you so much um, for that, that clarification. And I think there's a lot of excitement probably in the room, not to forget fathers as well and the pediatric um, setting. So thank you for that. Um, one last point for me, and then I'm going to give you each a minute to share your final thoughts here is this sort of notion of carrot versus stick. You know, we know it's really hard for providers and how do we support them? Um, or, you know, sort of the stick, like we know moms deserve to be screened and then you all just figure it out. We're going to mandate it. Um, I just thought it would be helpful to share that in California, there was no intent to first mandate screening. There was intent to provide case management support for both providers to have a referral pathway and parents to get support navigating the horrible uh, mental health, bifurcated mental health system and finding in-network providers. And interestingly, in the sausage making, as Rep Duplessis knows well, um, it was actually that case management part that got pulled out of this bill that included screening to follow case management um, a year or so later. And screening stuck. And we actually were quite worried about that initially, but we found that a lot of resources then got pulled into and pushed out to um, initiatives through hospitals and 
uh, large health systems, they were actually happy in some cases. Thank goodness you've mandated this because now we get to address it and prioritize it in our health system. So it was just a very interesting, um, I think, Sorry, folks, well, give us one moment. I am back. Sorry about that little glitch. Um, it was a great note, to, I think, to end on. I'm going to actually turn it back now to our um, panelists to make final closing remarks. Anything you want the audience to know about state policy? Um, we'll give you 30 seconds each, and then we'll wrap up. Um, hi. Um, so I would just really quickly, one of the things that we're looking at um, is uh, partnerships uh, with other public health priorities and how we can leverage uh, additional funding and support in legislative advocacy um, as we address perinatal mental health. So an example for us right now is we did a we did a data analysis of our maternal mortality data and found that over 50% of the women who died in Massachusetts or pregnancy associated deaths had a documented mental health condition in their record and were not screened and were not connected to services. And so being able to make that connection with maternal mortality and partnering with advocates for maternal mortality and mental health also looking at substance use has really allowed us um, a larger pool of advocates, a larger pool of funding, and hopefully um, additional supports and interventions um, for families. Such a great point, Beth, to tie it into that perinatal quality collaborative and maternal mortality review process in our states. Very good. Um, Amy, over to you. Any last remarks? Oh. Amy, Amy, you're muted. So hard uh, for me. <laughs> and for me, I've been thinking about what is the cascade of the early recognition on through response. And so not just the screening, but what then happens from there. And so one of the things that we've done that I'm excited about is develop is really just done a drawing of from that what needs to happen, the steps of a provider being able to screen from then knowing what to do to then getting to diagnostic, then to getting to care and treatment. So that we can identify the points where we can see where there might be the biggest problems and gaps and then where is it that we can intervene and then do we want to intervene with a perinatal quality collaborative initiative do we want to intervene with a um with a, a consultation model system and things like that so if in every state there's an epstt benefit for children 0 to 21 how do we get that think of it in terms of a, a continuum and where where are the intervention points in that continuum I love that um, thinking. Thank you, Amy. And, and it sort of pulls us back to like data collection and quality improvement structures, which you hit on from IHI earlier, Amy. Thank you. Um, Representative Duplessis, um, when you unmute your line, we want to hear from you as well. Thank you all again. Um, uh, these conversations are always um, a two way street as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's an opportunity for me to share what I'm working on and, and my thoughts, but it's also an opportunity for me to continue to learn. And the question that we oftentimes run into, not often, but all the time we run into is this issue of, like you said, Joy, you know, do we mandate? Do we uh, try to encourage kind of like the carrot versus the stick when we recognize the importance of the issue that we're talking about, which is the, the health of mothers, the health of babies? Um, you know, how do you leave certain things just how do you not mandate certain things, right? When we're, when we're all supposed to be collectively uh, joined in terms of our, our desire to see the mom in her best health and the babies in their best health. And, and, and but this isn't limited just to one area. You know, I run into it when I'm trying to do issues around housing. Uh, I'm working on some, some legislation right now around safety and ride shares. Like nobody likes to be told what to do especially professionals who have dedicated their lives to a particular field of practice. Uh, those who are, uh, who, who are doctors, whether they're OBGYN or whether they're pediatricians. Um, so trying to find that right balance. And uh, thankfully in Louisiana, 
we do have the Medicaid coverage that will be able to allow for that, for those services to be provided. So uh, that's that's a good piece. But on the private reimbursement, that's something that we're going to have to have to work on there. Uh, but I'm looking forward to working in collaboration with all of the the advocates and the stakeholders and 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 and, and 2020 Mom and all, all of all of these folks across the country to, to to continue to push this very very important issue, whether it requires legislation or not. Excellent. Um, thank you so much to our panel. So we went just a few minutes over, uh, but I want to say thank you. And um, uh, we are going to pull up our poll everywhere poll now and get to ask our audience to share the keywords that resonated with them. I think it's coming up here shortly. Excellent. So you again can um, type in, uh-oh, I'm seeing something a little different, but our, our, standard, uh, our standard screen should be up, which you might remember says, pollev.com backslash 2020 mom. That's what you should enter poll in your web uh, browser, pollev.com backslash 2020 mom. And Josh, if you can, oh, we're showing you the results right now. Um, and Josh, if you don't mind going back to that other slide, just to make sure folks got the, the right instructions from me, and then we'll share, uh, we will share. You can the see the instructions at the top of the screen. Respond to pollev.com. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Josh. Slash 2020 mom. Word for me. Very good. So keep those words coming. Change and vote. I think that vote word's an important one, especially as we head into an election year. Find out who, which of your candidates are supporting mental health and maternal health, and don't be shy about um, calling them and messaging them about the importance of addressing maternal mental health. Um, fathers change. Uh, we don't always need legislation, data, data, data. Excellent. Keep your words coming. Uh, we appreciate it. We'll save the final word cloud to Whova.